Martin Bouchai, welcome back to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Hey Rob, good to see you and thanks for having me again. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's um, it's always a pleasure to chat and especially when it's when it's on the podcast, make it official. But since we last spoke, lots has changed as we've been discussing for the last 15 minutes. Can you give us a bit of an update on what you're currently doing? Because it'd be very different to what people have, have heard before. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think last time we chat, uh, I was full on with the, um, the research initiative, Kitman and, and so on. Um, then I've been head of performance for Lille uh, in France. Uh, we had two amazing, amazing, cool, very good, good seasons. Uh, then moved to Olympique de Lyon over the summer. Didn't last long. Uh, long story short, uh, the difficulties of, uh, of elite football. And that's also a bit of a drive for the, the, the work I had been doing before, but I'm pushing even more now is uh, to withdraw. I withdraw myself a little bit for now, at least, uh, you know, it's it's uh, February. So you don't know what's the, the football world can what can happen in this world. But I, right at the moment, since I, I left Lyon, I withdraw myself from 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 that to to really work on a more on a consultancy basis. Um, um, and as as consultant, you know, you try to develop a bit of a portfolio. So you do a bit of a consultancy. And I'm really keen into helping teams in terms of reviewing their processes, evaluating what they do, and then try to provide um, guidance based on my experience and so on. So that's the real the consultancy bits, but also uh, keeping doing the research, collaboration, uh, different organization, um, doing a bit of a mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring, which is something I had not done that deeply before. I enjoy it as well for the fact that you really feel that you empower individual people to do better in their job, in their life. So that's, that's pretty cool. And you're a bit the big, the, like the, the big brother. Um, yes. And then conferences, workshops uh, keeps me busy. Allow me to still, that still allow me to, to travel, to meet people, to get the, the network going, to see what's happening in the other side of the world, which I definitely I just enjoy that. And also the, the cool things about workshops, you know, it's a bit more interaction than just giving lectures or conferences. So again, I get more from from being with those people, but also you get uh, to understand the question better that have people looping back to doing the research that is meaningful and so on. And I think people have heard me talking about that all, all my life, you know, doing meaningful research, you know, so um, yeah, long, long, long response. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm busy for sure. Um, so, enjoying it, enjoying it. So, is it more stressful or less stressful, or just a different kind of stress than being empl employed by a club? Um, no, I keep saying that the level of stress on a scale from zero to ten is probably on zero point one, which is more making sure I'm a, I'm on time for for school uh, and get the kids to 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 taking them to to their sport when I'm home when I'm when I'm not traveling. Uh, but for sure, you know, when you work in those environment. There's about the stress of the victory, the injuries, and so on. Um, but it's more, you're busy. But what all, always had a cost to me is having to convince people and having to work with people with other opinions, whether they're good or bad or whatever. And like that's, that's also a big question from the Eagles book that we also discussed about that together with... Uh, um, with uh, George uh, back in the days, you know, but it's always been the challenge for me, uh, the complexity of, of people with certain personality types, profiles, having different opinions, dealing disagreement and so on. And that's that people maybe who deal better than, than me with this, the aspect on, on, on dealing with difficult people, put it this way. So having withdrawn myself, at least temporary uh, from that world, I don't have pressure. I don't have. I don't have to, anyone to convince, or I convince the people who actually want to work with me. So that's pretty straightforward. I'm not saying that's the best way to to improve and progress because, of course, it's always t when you are in the difficulty and the challenges that you learn and so on. So I'm not saying that's the only way. But back to your question about the level of stress, uh, it's it's all right at the moment. It's definitely all right uh, given this this perspective of evaluating the stress. There's no conflict at the moment. I know, I know you've worked abroad before, but would you consider working abroad again? I know you're doing some consultancy with people all over the world and things, but in oh, terms yes. of a, in terms of a full-time position, would you go abroad again? Yes, no, definitely. Uh, as I said, um, it's just about finding um, the right organization, the right structure, the right organization. 
because again, people in my role, you know, you always your middle of the of the sandwich, you know, on one side you have uh, the players and the other staff that you have to convince to work with you or for you or having in the direction that you have that you have inside of you. On the other side, there is the CEO, the management, the, the president, uh, sporting director who also wants um, to give their directions. And so I think when everyone is kind of aligned, you know, when you have support from the above, good connection with your colleagues and so on, everything is kind of aligned and it's it's extremely um, uh, pleasant. You, you enjoy definitely having having the ability to deliver some good work and having the, the that's that's uh, that's fulfilling you know when things are aligned and you, you believe that you can actually drive the things you want to do and you're you're on a mission and things are are, are going how, how you wish uh, but one side of the other side of the the, the the sandwich one side of the bread is not the one you like or you want or they would they don't want you then it becomes again difficult back to what I was saying before you know so of course I would like uh, maybe to come back in into the, the this uh, this situation, but with the, the right ingredient at, the, at this stage. You're gonna re- you're gonna publish an article on Sportsmith in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, but you've spoke about this on other mediums and different articles and and podcasts as well. And this is, and I'm just gonna refer to the article that is gonna be published on Sportsmith. And and you reference the the threat of highly skilled practitioners to the hierarchy to that one side of the sandwich that you've you've mentioned the, the administration the ceo etc why have you all, how in what situations have you have you observed that where the highly skilled practitioner is actually a threat to what goes on up the chain again we don't have to put everyone in the same same bag uh, but what happens often is that um, decision maker in, in in clubs don't have the, the typical profile, academic academic background, the personality profile, to really be those big managers, big decision makers. So let's say the caricature will be they just ex players and they just come in just because they have a name. And whether nice, either they're, they're nice or I don't talking about most of the time they're nice ni- nice guys. You know, there's no problem, but they don't have all this background. So they feel themselves pretty quickly in the position of the imposter having to manage people that are actually clever than us or people that have a bigger vision or at least they have a vision when those guys may not have a vision. So there's a moment they have to to realize that either they find a way f- to use those highly skilled practitioners for their own benefit and then everyone's happy because they might support you, giving you more freedom, giving you, I don't know, budget or whatever. But when they don't understand that they could still keep their job and doing and look look good using those highly skilled people behind them, if they don't realize that, they feel that there's a competition and they actually they just get they get afraid of being yeah, be, have, being betrayed or they just don't don't understand the dynamic and they just they just have fear and in this case they rather tend to dismiss those people so that they keep control. Uh, knowing what they what they know and not knowing what they don't know as as often. How did how did you deal with that if when you were in that particular situation and and did did the hierarchy and then we'll come on to this when it comes to KPIs and things in a second but did the hierarchy across your career generalization understand what you did so you could communicate and not justify, but communicate your role and your the, the actual impact that you were having. Obviously, the first point is actually for these people to know what the hell you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Now, I've been through, and thankfully, because that's always been very informative for me in my, in my, my learning and understanding about this landscape, I've been, let's say, exposed to probably the completely opposites or the whole spectrum so working with uh, sporting directors that really, really had an understanding of what would be my value, like a, I've said my, like a head of performance value, who's not a conditioning coach, who's not a nutritionist, who's not a physio, you know? So understanding <clears throat> the value of having someone that actually push the, the, the envelopes in, so like there's the innovation, the coordination and so on. So they understand that. Uh, and in this case, the organization takes this position as an asset and this is where things are again i'm talking about everything being aligned but i'm also working with sporting director who did not understand at all what would be uh, so- someone like me for 
the lack, as I said, that does back to what you were saying before, your know, lack of education, understanding, knowledge, experience, um, but also for the for the simple fact that they might not even, um, yeah, under, understand why do you need more than just a conditioning coach and intuitionist, you know, um, based on what they've been exposed before and so on. So, so it's good because then, I mean, you know, by, by the time the experience you build up, I'm talking about, not talking about what I've experienced myself, but, you know, I've had just endless chat with, with colleagues and my peers, and we've all been in the same, same situation at some stage, especially with the constant change. And I like to say that one of the only, one of the only constants is the change in, in this world. So you just have to, Again, find find a find a find the best way to to adapt and understand. Okay, uh, this new sporting director, this new president, what is this? What is his level of understanding of what we try to do? Um, and then it depends on how what how you can actually get into their world and try to to get them to understand what what you're here for. So again, is it something that is really grounded in the club job descriptions? Who's accountable for what? Is it a proper process with HR? Then, hopefully, this guy is going to talk to HR and am I able to, to, to explain a bit what's the structure, uh, what the department is made for. Uh, but when there's nothing like that in place, it's just about, oh, okay, there's a new guy coming in. Who are those budge guys in, uh, in tracksuit in the, in the locker? I see a few, uh, few conditioning coach. Well, what are the two guys fluffing around uh, with their computers? Um, yeah, and then you start... You just have to start from the scratch. You know, you may have worked your ass off for, for years building something. When someone else comes in and says, I don't know who you are. Uh, yeah, we don't know who you are either. Okay, so what are you doing? Uh, yeah, fine. But, you know, there's, no, there's no, nothing to, to, to build on. Um, so that's also a big part of what I'm doing now. And I like to say I'm, I'm on a mission. Uh, just again, to bring some level of, of objectivity and a bit of structure in, into into that which is not because again people probably they, they've heard about some of the stuff I've done on the research which is really strength conditioning sport science it's a way to bring objectivity in our practices okay because again you can never undervalue the importance of experience because that's how coaches are built and that's how we are whether our is a <clears throat> whatever our our background but we build our work and what we deliver on experience but we also know that we still have a lot of open questions and bringing the evidence the research helps sometimes to make better decision and we talk about those informed decision which is using a bit of research bit of data to improve the decision making but of course always having the context that kind of drives the final decision so that's about sports science and so on but why couldn't we bring the same objectivity into the world um <clears throat> into the the, into the jobs, into what we were discussing about, you know, why couldn't we have a proper evaluation of staffs? We evaluate player, we evaluate their strength, their fitness, and so on, and then we profile them, and then we offer them tailored training interventions. Why couldn't we evaluate staffs? Okay, what, what are you good at? What are maybe the, your, 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 weaker, your, your, your weaker capacities? Let's build on that, and then we can move on to the discussion about CPD and so on. But that's another part of the, of, of the need to evaluate properly staff and department. But another angle is back to what we were just saying about, okay, there's a new CEO coming in. Who are those guys? And are they valuable for the organization or not? Hey, look at what we do. Look at how, what we have been. Look at, our, look at our achievement. What are the outcomes of the department? And, and so on. So it's a way to not to prove ourselves, but at least to bring a little bit of, of fairness into how people are perceived in this world. So again, back into, you were saying about the, this uh, skilled practitioner who's uh, not really seen with a good eye from, from the boss, but how is he evaluated? Just a feeling, it's a chat, is how he looks, is he friendly, is he smiling? You know, you, you can't hire and dismiss people just on, on feelings. At some stage, you just need to raise the bar, especially if we talk about big organization with big money. You know, you just can't, you can't, you just can't hire people based on, on, on that. So same as the sports science and the football world and so on and the, the strength and conditioning, why, don't we, why can't we do that with people and departments? It has to be. So why isn't this happening? What are the, what are the challenges to actually making this happen in the first place? I would say that 
uh, well, first of all, there's the definitely a cultural aspect of it because it's elite sports and it's not uh, corporate, it's not Google, it's not, uh, you know, the, it's not, it's a different world. So first of all, it's not something that is ingrained in the, in the culture, in the habits. You don't have habits to, to, that's not something that is, that it was done because at the start, like 15, 20 years ago, you had one conditioning coach and he was in charge of everything. So his job description was do what you can in the time you have. And that, that was done, you know. But now, because we have specialists and, and staffs are getting bigger, now we need to define that the, we have a proper description where the mission start and when they end, because that's also another layer where people probably have roles that overlaps and creates confusion and noise and so on. But I mean, so the, to your question, why this is not happening? Cultural. First, back to the people in charge on top of those organizations, back to what I was saying, there might not always be the most educated in terms of a proper structure, HR, and these kind of things. I'm not saying that those guys are not doing, that they're definitely doing a great job on many other levels. They know the sport, they know the players, they have empathy. They, so they have very, very good assets to be doing a good part of their job. But because they haven't been to, they haven't done six or eight years of, uh, of academic school as a sport, the equivalent of a sporting director would do if he was in a corporate, in an IT company. So having, not having this background about how do we structure um, jobs, how do we evaluate people and so on, that doesn't happen just because the way those people are recruited at the top. The other, let's say, uh, part of explanation of that is that this is just crazy difficult. It's ridiculously difficult to assess and to provide, if you put the, 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 the magic keywords like uh, those KPIs, those key performance indicator, is way harder to have KPIs for a multidisciplinary team or a physio or a nutritionist than for a car a car seller or um, or any any guy working in, in the IT company, you know, uh, because on one side you just look at number of clients that the guy reached, the conversion rate, how much cars were sold once he reached them, and then. How many he's making at the end for the for the company? Pretty pretty clear way to both evaluate the outcome and that way we can take that as, as KPIs. Um, how do you really evaluate uh, a physio? How do you really evaluate a conditioning coach? Um, it's just not just about winning games, of course, you know. And that's how often the, in, in football in any sport it works. You know, you don't have you don't have good results. Mm. Must be something going wrong with the with the fitness, and if in addition guys are not running during matches, of course it's just they're not running because they're not fit, and then you just close the loop and end of the story, you know. Uh, while we know, of course, it's a little bit more complex than that, you know. Um, you have injuries; you always have the the medical is always blamed. While I still don't understand why in this case medical should be blamed. Maybe you don't have you have a long return to play times. Maybe those guys may be a bit more involved uh, because actually they, they're trying to accelerate. But the injuries that comes more to where the injury comes from, which is probably more coaches, conditioning, and players. But anyway, so you get you get the big picture outcomes: winning games, uh, running a lot, getting injured or not. And on that, we're going to evaluate the quality of the work of a physio or a nutritionist. And there's just too many layers. To, to really take those guys accountable. They, of course, they have uh, everyone working in a club has a shared responsibility into what happens over the weekend. Of course, we all have a responsibility. Now, just think about the magnitude of this percentage, you know? The, the physio versus scoring three goals or conceiving two. They, there is a link or there is, but you know, let's, let's be serious, you know? So I think everyone will agree that it may, may t make a little bit more sense to evaluate those practitioners' um, value or competency based on objective markers of their actual job, you know? And that's how we ended up, or we started the, the, the journey. Um, and for that, I was joined um, by two colleagues, Luca Schuster and, and Ryan King, helped me to develop the, the, the questionnaire, we did the survey, we reach out to, to people like in, in those types of, of role of head of performance, uh, medicals and so on. 
and say, guys, uh, if you really want to, to evaluate your, your staff and you have to rate KPIs, which makes a good physio, a good, a good conditioning coach, what is important, what is not, you know? And that's really the, the, then the start of the reflection. And of course, to be a good, a, good, uh, a good strength coach, you have to know at least, of course, a bit of, uh, about your, your stuff, you know, the adaptation, the loading, uh, the, the specificity of the sport to be able to, pro to, to offer something that is, that is relevant with the sport and the periodization, of course. But there's so many more things that almost come first. I'm not saying first because you have to tick the box and know your, know your thing for sure. But then what makes the difference between a good and an average or even a bad practitioner, it's definitely down to people and skills, personal traits, interaction, ability to, co ability to communicate and so on. And they're just a, a bunch of personal, individual, psychological factors that make the difference. And that was probably the, the biggest findings from this survey is how important those those interpersonal people skills were rated way higher again once the base is is okay you don't want to hire someone that doesn't know about strength if he has to do deliver session but once they know what makes a difference is on the other side nothing new uh, but it, it was nice to see that uh, rated by again 50 people putting again a little bit of objectivity in the process when it comes to offering those evaluation grids for practitioner. And of the back of that, I kept developing a bit the, 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 the project, the approach, which is also a part of what I'm doing now, definitely. As I said, I'm on a mission. I've been on a mission for years about the, the research to bring objectivity in the, the training, in the, what we do as practitioners. Let's bring, let's bring the objectivity on, on the other side as well. So, so were them 50 people all heads of performance or were they slightly down the chain as well? Mm, or head of something a little bit so that you have to at least to, to manage and at some stage have to evaluate people uh, but a lot of head of medicals doctors head of physios uh, because I've put everyone in the same bag in this case um, like I like to talk about the multidisciplinary team so basically sports science conditioning nutrition physio medicine that's the big bag in big clubs could be 15 people in other, it's uh, six or seven, but you have this range of, yeah, let's say six to 16 people, they work together. Then the organization within this multidisciplinary team is almost different in every club. You know, sometimes you have the high performance manager which, leaves, which kind of leads everyone. Then sometimes you just have a head of medical, a head of performance. They have two separate kind of departments, but still, they still work together, you know? So I think the multidisciplinary team, whether whatever the number of really of heads, these are the guys who actually work together and they're responsible for the health and the performance of the players. So this is the, the, the strong base club staff that needs to be well looked after. This is the staff that you want to, that's, that's the permanent staff. That's the staff you want to nurture. That's the staff you want to, you want to build a strong multidisciplinary team so that when coaches come in and come out, they can just plug themselves and just use them at their best, make sure the, and then, then it's about the, the, co the coordination between this multidisciplinary team and the coaching staff. But clubs need to nurture their, their multidisciplinary team because this is going to give them the base to handle and support the change in staff. And again, in clubs where this is not well understood, they kind of they keep changing staff every every second month. But they also tend to change as well the the, the, the guys in the multidisciplinary teams. Then it's chaos at all levels. So at least you have to, to, to understand that the only way to support change is to have some stability and consistency at some levels as well. So having a strong multi everything, strong structures at the club level guarantees or allows you to actually better, let's say, absorb the, 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 the chaos when, when coaches changes. And as a way to look after those staff, start with an objective evaluation of their work and to be able to offer them uh, personal development plans and, and so on. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me, at least. Just, just playing devil's advocate here, when a member of staff, head of medical, head of physiotherapy or whatever it is, would go into a club, my understanding would be sometimes that member of staff may be wanting a uh, win bonus. 
okay? So they get the win bonus, they get a whatever percentage. But then if they're getting that when the team wins, if the team loses, they can't necessarily complain that they're going to be not sacked, but reprimanded in some sort of way if the team loses. Because we, we both know that neither really affects the other, like a tiny bit. But if you're going to get cash for a win, you're going to accept that you're going to get your ass kicked when you lose, even though neither of them have nothing to do with you. Yeah, I think if following your, your reasoning, I think you're, you're right. If it goes on one way, it has to go on, on, on the other. And that's always been the big discussion I had with um, like myself, with uh, my employers or again with, with colleagues. In our roles, when you really have a club role, do you, do you really need or should have incentives based on team results? I would tend to say no in this case. But now you're the assistant coach, like you're the, the conditioning guy of the coach. Of course, let's, that's, that's part of the, part of the, the game, you know. Um, but that club staff, I would definitely uh, have incentives based on a lot of other and probably way more important criteria on the medium to long term to make sure this department is growing and building. So we're back to having objectives, assessments of a staff value and quality of work. And in this case, if for various reasons the department or the staff are ticking those boxes, then they can have their incentives. Who does this really well? What kind of environments that you've been exposed to do this really well in terms of evaluation, staff evaluation, key performance indicators? And what can we, where can we learn from those guys? Well, of course, we have to learn from outside of uh, of elite sports. Not, I'm not saying that, and uh, I don't know, I don't know the whole planet of elite sport, you know. And the other day, just by chance, I was just hearing uh, Des Ryan talking about uh, implementing CPDs on the back of evaluation. So I said, ah, oh, perfect. So this happens at least, you know. So I'm sure there's there's there must be there, there are some clubs who do that already very well. And I'm definitely not saying that I'm reinventing the wheel at all, you know. So there are already some organizations that might be more UK, US, a bit of uh, for sure than probably South Europe or, you know, um, for sure. Uh, again, based to the, the cultural aspect. So that, thankfully, it's already happening in elite sport, but I don't think it's probably the, the standard or, you know, that does reflect the overall practice. But back to your question about where shall we learn from, or even myself, where did I get more information? I went to all my, my contacts, my friends working in the corporate world, and it's easy around us. We have people working. I mean, when you look at the, our friends, we are probably the exception working in, in elite sport, and most of the people you meet at school, and when you drop the kids, they are working in IT, in banks, in real estate, or, you know, and those guys, it's just part of their work. They have their the one real to world. <laughs> yes, they have a one to one with their boss uh, every week. They have uh, two or three times a year uh, an assessment about what they do. They set KPIs together with their boss. They have incentives on those KPIs and so on. So it just actually it's kind of the norm. So I went to to chat with a few uh, friends working in HR, and I said, just tell me how in HR in the corporate world, and I said, tell me how it works. And it was like, yes, 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 makes sense. So now translate that to, to, the, to, to our world. And it's not coming without difficulties for what we were discussing is that the, the actual KPIs are way more difficult to implement. But if you just sit uh, with people and make sure it's really always adapted to the context, to the actual job description, you always manage to, to find a, a, few, a few key points that you can really base your evaluation on. Um, so yeah, back to your question. A few few good friends of mine working in top companies in HR, they've been really really helpful to get uh, all this project uh, going and becoming becoming actually live now. So in terms of implementing or starting this process, I'm an assistant S and C coach at a championship club, for example. Can I go and look at your information and lift off? the KPIs that have been identified by the people that have filled in the survey based on an assistant S&C coach and run with that? Or is there a lot of work in the 
front end based on my context and based on my club and based on my intricacies of the role that have to be taken into account. I'm just trying to piece this together so people can go, okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to run with that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, no, I would say it's uh, unfortunately not as uh, as straightforward. And that's why it took me a lot of time to fine tune the project on my side as well. You know, that's the stuff we had started back in the days in, in Paris. So that's close to <clears throat> when I started 10 years ago. Um, and every organization where I had worked directly, I kind of refined the process as I was into the role, as I was chatting with colleagues and so on. So, of course, you know, you just read this paper, the research paper with uh, with Luca and, and Ryan. Uh, you get the big you get the big rocks. And as we were discussing, you know that you have to evaluate your staff on a lot of things that are not only the core of the practice, but those personal skills, the communication quality. So, you know roughly where to look at, which is already a good start. And let's say this is now a little bit more evidence informed process because we have this research that backs us backed, backed up a little bit the, the, the process. But now when it comes to really implementing that and making that work, you have to tailor as always. And that's probably the best, the first thing that all those guys working in HR told me is that it has to be very, very you have to mold that. You mold that. You have to tailor that to to the environment. Because first of all, the question you're going to evaluate every staff, they have to fit with their job description. So you can't be you can't be just a, a, a copy paste from a questionnaire to another, because in this club, and again, you, you're talking about the number of staff, and then you you just adapt your job description based on how, how many people are actually doing the same job as you. In a lower level club, you might have. Yeah, one conditioning coach does the sports science, does the nutrition and so on. So we may we, we have to evaluate him on the different areas of, of, his, of his daily work. If you go into a big club where there are five conditioning coaches and one is just doing the gym strength, we're going to have to evaluate him way, way more into detail about his knowledge about gym strength because that's the only thing he has to do a day. So the questionnaire in this case, the first level questionnaire to understand how good is he as what not what he can do, but what he has to do in this context. So it really job description first that often doesn't even exist. So imagine the, the, the amount of work. The same. <laughs> so start with what is your job description? I don't have one. Okay, let's build one. HR happy, manager happy. Okay, bam, that's your job description. So now how based on, on the back of that, how do we evaluate your value based on that? And then we go, okay, what's good, what's average, what's not good enough? Let's do. Let's see what we can do, and this is probably also the biggest. Uh, not also, ch it's kind of a challenge. Is that um, these evaluation you have to present them in a in, in a wise way that it's actually it's, it's going to help everyone. It's going to prove, let's say you are especially if is likely you are you you you're doing well your job. You know, it's a good way to to showcase your value to the up management, as I was telling before, you know, when there's no change, who's this guy, who is it good or not, you know, okay. So showcase your value. So it's positive for you as a staff. In a way, say, okay, accept to be evaluated, you know, to be, to be like this review is going to be helpful for you because we're going to show you that you're, you're doing good your job, you're do, doing a good job. And then it's about personal development plans. Okay, there might still areas that you're not mastering completely yet. Fair enough. Okay, so if now we have to prepare a CPD budget plan for next season, hold on, how much do you, what do you need and how much do you need? So that's also super cool for yourself because it's going to, instead, before, how would you ask for a budget for a CPD? You would come to your boss, say, ah, I'd like to do, uh, I'd like to take this uh, membership for the premium for, for Sportsmith uh, because it's going to, to, to help me everywhere. <laughs> And the manager will say, it looks a bit expensive, no? Why don't you just uh, spend, uh, spend time at the, at the rugby club around the corner? I'm sure you'll learn a lot from them. So it's your arguments or your, uh, versus the, your boss' uh, opinion. And again, it's likely you're going to lose because the boss in the end decides and makes unsubstantially documented decisions just based on his opinion as often. But now you come with this assessment and say, hey, look, um, okay, 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 but there are some weaknesses like uh, that, are, that have been observed into this area. So I'd like that we find we found together we can find together a course that actually allow me to fill this gap. Bam! 
Simple. No? So back to your question about implementing that. Uh, no, unfortunately, it has to be almost a case by case study so that it's adapted to the context, the actual job description, the club, and so on and so on. Um, so it's a, there's, there's a bit of work. And that's the first part about the evaluation. On the back of the evaluation, uh, then you can set this development plan, but also uh, set some specific, really, really clear KPIs, which really be just down to a couple of items that are very clear. Give us, give us some examples, yes. Martin. Yeah, I, I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm realizing I'm, it's, it's, super, it's super unclear or abstract. So um, I like to take extreme examples, but I'm sure like everyone will actually recognize those, those, those profiles. Um, young, young practitioner, uh, finished his master a few years ago. He's just full on new generation technology, loves research. He's, again, he's on, on sports miss every second day, uh, reads everything super into like highly motivated new generation of practitioner, uh, lack experience, lack people skills. Come, first thing he, he says when he comes in the morning, he says, what's your RPE or what's your wellness score? But don't even think about saying hi or how did you, you know? So we've been, we've been through that. Uh, another practitioner will be that we've been, would, would have been at the club for 35 years, doesn't give a shit about technology, doesn't need to assess anything. He knows everything by his hands. He's a good guy. He's funny. He has a lot of empathy. Okay. Those two people, they work together and their skills are in a sense complementary because one is actually bringing to the team what the other can't bring. Uh, but there are often some frictions because they don't understand each other and so on. Uh, so classical happens everywhere. This. So devaluation will actually just a way to objective put up yeah, just to objectivate a little bit this situation or where the strength and the weaknesses of one or the other would be. And then we might say, okay, to the long lad, to the young lad, um, okay, there are maybe a few courses or you're going to find a mentor that's are going to help you to just to understand uh, a bit more about your emotional intelligence and, and you just drill down to what is actually missing. And the KPI in this case will be the number of time a week is actually, he actually managed to interact with someone uh, starting with something else than a wellness score or a CMG, a CMG jump, you know. Um, and with the other guy, his uh, KPI would just be the number of maybe courses or articles he's read um, because it's something he has never done before. So you just build up, okay, maybe now you start to read one or two articles a month and even, even better, you're going to present them to the, to the team uh, at lunch on, the, on a Thursday. For example, you know, and you just, you just, in the end, at the end, it's, in, it's almost infinite, uh, but it's, the, it's about the approach of finding something that reflects the profile of those people and then be able to track. Because the big thing, the second part of, of KPI is the tracking ability, the monitoring of the achievement or not. So again, you can come back at some stage when you have your, your individual review and so on, you say, okay, we set those KPIs together, but you still have not achieved them. What's the problem? And in this case, if it's at the stage where you have sometimes thought about dismissing someone, unfortunately, in this case, this can be used as well against, against you, against the person, but at least it's clear. You're not sacking someone just because you don't like him or the flavor of the month. Because now you have something that is actually clear. Look, if, you, if you're on the positive, you're gonna to have to take the negative as well, potentially. Yes, yes. And we offer you this uh, this money for your CPD. We've done this, 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 but this is not still, uh, still not happening. So give me an explanation. Or oh, I don't know. But again, we bring again some objectivity into the process on evaluating someone. I was talking about sacking someone. Hopefully, that's something you don't have to do because it's it's always a pain. And also you often have to justify the why. So when this is written and you have been able to follow and monitor that, then the decision becomes a little bit more expected. Okay. Look. But that's the worst case scenario on the other side. Uh, it's a good way to discuss incentives and pay rise and bonuses and, 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 and those positive aspects. And again, uh, you, as the head of department, you may not have always uh, the, the, the button on, uh, on the incentives. So you can go to the 
maybe sporting director or the, the bigger people and say, okay, guys, those two or three staff, they've been really super good achievers during this season. Give me, give me a bit of money for those guys that they, they, they just merit, they, they can get their bonus, you know. Again, it's not based on, I like them, let's pay them a bit, a bit more, you know. As a, as a head of, if you were in a head of performance position in a full-time club, you hadn't listened to this podcast, but there's an assistant or a regular SNC coach, sports scientist, nutritionist who has and knows all the things that are not in place for him or her. He or her hasn't got a job description. He or her doesn't uh, have regular one-on-ones with a line manager, doesn't have clear roles and responsibilities. If they want to approach this and attack this from up the chain versus ahead of performance, implement it down the chain, how would you want them to approach you about this? Um, that's exactly how I started myself, almost. You can write yourself your job description and then just ask for an approval from your N plus one as a way to show them that you want to start to bring a little bit of light into this, uh, this, this dark side. Uh, write your job description. And as a manager, I've asked my well, colleagues or the people I've been managing to write themselves as a start as well. So it's a good exercise. So then you can confront as a boss, as the boss, how you write the job description of this person and how this person is actually writing it. Normally, of course, that should not happen. When you sign your first contract, you should sign the job description. It's coming with it. But in the eventuality, it's not available. Uh, start with that and you start yourself. Wherever you are in the, in, the, in the ladder, make sure you have one at least. So if you don't have, just write it down. And, that, and the job description is something that's going to, evolve, it's going to um, evolve over time anyway? Because yes. year to year, yeah. you take on new responsibilities, you drop some because you've got a new member of staff. So that's an ongoing process. That Therefore, all this is an ongoing process, not something that's just done once, and then you evaluate at the end of the year or three times a year or whatever it is. It's, it's ongoing. Yes, of, of course. And it's not a problem at all that you go back regularly to this document and update it at least once a season. It could even be twice a, twice a season. Um, of course. But... Maybe it's something that I just said in between the lines, but the very important of that is that this has to be done in a tight collaboration with HR in the organization. Because you can't kind of by, bypass, because I, in the end, this is HR matter. Um, so back to your question, like, like you're the, you, are, you don't have a job description, yeah, do it on yourself. But don't go only to your boss, but go to your go to the HR at the same time. Put them put them all in, into the, 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 the loop. And that's when I operate myself with clubs, that's that's how I, I also I also work, you know. This as soon as I make contact and we we engage into into this process, and I often engage with my peers. These are the people willing to to to, to collaborate. And I'm like, okay, but make sure HR is on board and actually the way it should be is that HR, they see what I can offer as just an extension of, of, their, of their work because they know the structure, they know the process, they know all the laws, they know all the, the complicated that I, stuff that I don't, I don't know either. But we as practitioners, we know the jobs. We know, we know the things that are important to make those description, re, those job description really, really um, precise. So it's like we just work together. It's a collaboration process, and in the end, everyone wins. HR have, is a, they're having a better, bet, better product, better, better descriptions, and employees they just get uh, something that really relates to to actually what they do. Uh, but super important to involve HR uh, from the beginning, of course. You know. One last point, and it's definitely a reflective one for you. In the last couple of positions that you mentioned at the start for the last few years. On this topic, what would you have done differently, thinking back and reflecting? Um, well, um, I've been very, very quick always to, to write those job descriptions um, and trying to make people aware, others, about, okay, like typically, you know, two conditioning coaches, both of them, could be seen as doing the same thing because they have the same title. But one is more gym, individual. The other more is more pitch, team. Okay, let's write it down. So 
have, we've done it. We wrote it, but maybe we could have or we should have made sure that everyone would know it as well. It was something more internal to the multidisciplinary team, but maybe tell the players, tell uh, the sporting director, or I don't know, people at different levels. That is clear. Um, again, it depends the time and the openness to people because I've, I've put myself as well, that was in another context a, bit, a while ago now, when I came to see the sporting director with my job description that, that I had just written myself and he said, I don't, I don't need that. Okay, so, you know, you ask me how, if I would have done things differently, I wished I could have found a way for him to understand what my job description was. So what did you do on the back of that? Uh, went back to HR and I said, can you make sure he knows what I'm doing? Then not sure what, what actually happened. Um, but again, talking about those, those different levels and the sandwich and so on, at least in roles like, 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 like us, um, you can actually control one side of the, the, the sandwich and the bread, at least under you, you can have, you can, and you can be proud if you manage to do it well, but let's try to do things as good as you can at your level and below. So at least this is clean and uh, this is clean and clear. Then, if it's not going, you're not managing to push the the the, the effort to the to the top. Uh, that means it's going to be difficult for you at some stage, and as it has been for me. Um, but at least, yeah, you have to lead by the example in this case. So before asking the sporting director if he knew my job description, I had to make sure I knew the job description of all the staff working with, for, or on the side of me. You know. Perfect. Right. If anyone wants to get to know more about the research that you've done or anything future happen in this space, where's the, where's the best place, Martin? Um, I'm always uh, available on, on social media. My website, there's, there's uh, always all the new stuff I'm, I'm doing and there's a, there's a form you can, you can reach out. So um, yeah, I think I'm pretty, pretty easy to find on, on the web. Yep. So the, this, the, the, the uh, KPIs that you've quoted from, this article, this research that you've done with Luca and, and Ryan, where can that be found? Okay, so that was published in a SPSR, Sports Science Performance and, and Report. But again, that's also on, on my website. There's a blog part with all the, the, the research papers. Um, uh, title was the paper was Behind the Scoreboard, uh, something around yeah evaluation of, of staff and department. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's a few more stuff coming out uh, in terms of, of research, of, of papers, opinion on, on the topic. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you might, uh, there's something I just written for the Football uh, Performance Association, uh, the, the journal. Uh, there might be something coming out with uh, with you guys as well. So there might be more through that, a, a good way to, to, to read more. And uh, if people want to reach out, um, yeah, definitely, please to, to help them on, on this, uh, this second mission after they have now after after the pure uh, sports science perfect right look forward to keeping in touch look forward to seeing what happens in this space and uh we'll chat soon thanks awesome. again martin thank you very much as, as always thank you very much take care